Welcome to this Whole Life Action Hour. I am Ocean Robbins, co-founder and CEO of Food Revolution Network, and I am thrilled to be here with you to introduce a topic that is so important in the world right now, which is how to eat plant-based on a budget. One of the top concerns that a lot of people have about healthy eating is that it can be expensive. But eating more whole foods and less processed junk does not have to break your budget. As we're gonna learn today, you can eat really well and you can save money at the same time. And so we're gonna look at how you can cut out food waste, how you can base your diet around the, the healthy staples, how you can save time when you prepare food at home and other tips for frugal plant-based eating. This is so you can save up more money for the things that matter to you and invest in your health at the same time. If you wanna know how to make this all happen, you are in the right place because we are here today with Tony Okamoto, who is the founder of Plant Based on a Budget. That's the popular website and meal plan that shows how you can save dough by eating veggies. Tony is also author of Plant Based on a Budget, co-author of the vegan, or excuse me, the Friendly Vegan Cookbook, and the co-host of the Plant Powered People podcast. Tony's work has been profiled by NBC News, Parade Magazine, and in the popular documentary, What the Health. She teaches people how to break a meat habit without breaking their budget. Tony, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I want to go ahead and say before we go any further uh, that uh, nothing we're saying here today is medical advice. This is coaching. We're sharing our own best insights. But of course, you should always consult with a qualified healthcare professional about your specific medical issues and needs. That said, you are going to learn a lot today. So Tony, let's just jump right in here. A lot of people uh, are concerned about the high cost of healthy food. Whole Foods has gotten the unfortunate nickname Whole Paycheck. And uh, in some ways, almost tragically, healthy food has become the domain of sort of an elitist luxury in some people's minds, as if it's only for the wealthy and powerful to get healthy by eating healthy food while the poor are focused on nutritional disasters. And of course, this is partly a product of government subsidies of commodities crops that bring down the price of high fructose corn syrup and white flour and factory farmed meat. And in a sense, therefore, by comparison, drive up the price of fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and the foods we should be eating more of. But you're saying that it's still completely possible, even with this sort of perverse system of subsidies, and even with all of the incentives that the food industry has to cut corners, it's still possible to eat really well without spending an arm and a leg. So what are the top things we need to know about that? That is so true. Well, first I should say, I know from experience when I became plant-based uh, and started looking more into what vegan was, I didn't know anything. I had come from a really standard American diet. And then when I wasn't eating standard American processed food, I was eating Mexican food or Japanese food. I'm Japanese Mexican. And so I, I really didn't know how to cook all of the amazing plant-based dishes. I didn't even know a kale or a sweet butternut squash or brown rice or quinoa or anything like that. And as I began to explore, I realized how it was much cheaper than eating some of the processed foods I was eating. And I have since spent the past 15 years uh, learning how to count my pennies and make it count. I was on a very, 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 very serious budget when I became plant-based. And so I know from experience that it can be done. So uh, how... T tell us what we, since you were tracking everything, yes. what, what it, you, you've eaten well on how much per year? I would say, uh, per, per week you can, although I don't anymore, but I was, and I do have meal plans for showing $25 a week on your food budget for wow. one person. Getting like your basic nutritional needs met. Mm hmm. I made sure that there were there was protein that you had your cruciferous vegetables. Uh, I was in one of the meal plans. I made sure to follow at the daily dozen, and it worked out. Uh, that one was thirty dollars for the week to get in all of my nuts and seeds and things like that. But it it was doable, and it requires some effort and some top tips that I recommend are always meal planning. Meal planning is 
the key to success, making sure yeah. you're not making impulsive purchases, making sure you're not putting yourself in a position where you're hungry and tired and you don't know what to make uh, and you make a bad decision going to the restaurant or the fast food place or wherever else, uh, just setting yourself up for success by planning and also doing inventory, taking inventory of what you have already and using that up and building your meal plan around the ingredients in your pantry and in, in your refrigerator so that you can prevent food waste and so that you don't have to go buy a ton more groceries and not use up what you already have. And just to emphasize here, if some of you are watching thinking, oh my gosh, I, I don't need to live on $25 a week. Well, you don't necessarily have to, but if you're tight on cash, it sure is good to know how. Yes. And, and what's more, if you do base your diet in a really simple way that enables you to save tons and tons of money, then you can splurge a little bit as resources allow, and you're still not breaking the bank. And what this means is you can have more money available for other things for time exactly. off, which is also good for your health, for, for family vacations, for supporting people who are struggling or in need. Uh, I think it was Mahatma Gandhi who said, refuse to have what the masses cannot, or Henry David Thoreau who said, I make myself rich by making my wants few. When we practice the art of frugality, we can free up oceans of energy and resources and time and money for the things that matter most to us, or we can just stop sort of working around the clock just to, to pay for expenses for things that we don't really, really need. So we're talking about freedom here. We're talking about mobility and power here. And we're talking about frugality. So Tony, you said meal planning was the cornerstone. Walk us through, like, how do you actually implement meal planning in this way? When I am meal planning, as I mentioned, I first do a run through of what I have in my pantry and I pull out some of the staples. Maybe I have some dried beans that need to be cooked and, and I'll build my meal plans around that. I usually choose four meals that I want as um, the entrees for the week. And I double batch them or triple batch them so that I'm not cooking a lot throughout the week. Everyone is so busy. They've got work, they've got kids, they've got all these obligations, or they just don't want to be spending all their time in the kitchen. So making the use of the time that you are prepping and making sure that you're triple batching or double batching so that you can eat those meals multiple times and, and really get your efforts worth is helpful in my kitchen. So I pick four recipes, I triple batch them, and then I do things like overnight oats, I smoothie prep. So I'll put in, uh, I have these stasher bags, which are reusable silicone bags that you can throw in the freezer. I put in all the smoothie stuff that I want, seal those up. And then in the mornings, when I'm in a rush, I can toss those in the blender and just add my plant-based milk. So it makes everything so much easier and um, saves a lot of time, which is a lot of, is, is my most valuable asset these days. And yeah, and uh, just budget friendly all around. And that's such a good point because, you know, a lot of people are not just struggling with having enough money, but also enough time. And so what you're saying is that batch cooking is one of the answers to that. And, and it makes a lot of sense because of course it doesn't take three times as much time to make three times as big a recipe. It, it adds some time, but not nearly three times as much to go in higher quantities. There's a little more chopping and so forth. Things cook, take longer to cook, but in general, a lot of the components are the same, whether you're cooking one batch or five batches. So in our home, we actually cook, um, we cook in quantity and we, we share with people, we, we pool food with, with other families that are close to us. We live kind of in a community of sorts. And we also uh, cook, you know, always way more than one meal at a time. So there's always leftovers in the fridge and sometimes in the freezer, if we're not gonna be able to keep up. Um, but the average American family wastes $2,000 a year on food that goes bad, that literally goes bad in the fridge. Most of that tragically is fruits and vegetables. And um, that's really sad. Of course, that's a lot of money that's getting thrown down the drain. Apparently more than enough to feed an entire person for a year if they're doing what you recommend. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it's also um, a lot of resources. 
In fact, in the United States, we waste about half the food we grow, if you can believe that. So when we talk about issues like desertification and, and topsoil erosion, aquifer depletion, water crisis, which I live in California, that's a, that's a big deal here. When we talk about climate change, when we talk about how we're gonna feed a growing human population, well, hello, here we are wasting almost half the food we grow. And worldwide, it's over a quarter of the food growing on planet Earth, never reaches human mouths. And of course, when you factor in livestock, even worse, because it takes 12 pounds of grain or soy to produce one pound of feedlot beef. So the other 11 are essentially getting wasted. So we've got a lot of opportunity here, not just to save money, but also to save resources and frankly, to help save our planet. Um, Tony, um, when we look at uh, food waste, what are some of the top tips for cutting that down? Learning how to store it first so that it can maximize the lifespan, we'll say, of your leafy greens like kale or your herbs like cilantro. The way I make mine last longer, I treat them like a bouquet of flowers. I cut the tips, I put them in a glass of water, uh, you can put one of those sasher bags over it, like I mentioned, to give it some extra security. And it lasts days, if not a full week longer, depending on what it is. So learning how to store it so that you can get the, the maximum lifespan. And then also meal planning comes back into it, buying only what you need. You don't, I, I feel like we have this desire to just, Bye, 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 just, just in case, just we might need it. It's on sale, uh, but we don't need it. And yeah. if you have a plan and you stick to that plan and you don't make those impulsive purchases uh, at the grocery store, you will use up your food because that's what you have. And then lastly, if you have, um, if you save your food scraps, you can turn those into a vegetable a vegetable stock, your, your veggie scraps. If you have bananas that are going bad, just cut those up and toss them in the freezer so that you can make banana bread or smoothies. Learning how to use what's on its way out or paying attention to what's on its way out and using it before it goes bad will save you a lot of money and will make you, I, I know for me, it feels, I feel bad like I'm throwing my money in the trash whenever I am uh, tossing my food. So it, it'll make you feel better. Yeah, absolutely. Well, here's a, here's a common scenario. I go to the store, I've got a shopping list. Everything on it is good, healthy foods that we need. I'm walking through the store. I see things in the aisles that weren't on my list. And they look, they've got pretty packages and they look fun. And I'm like, oh, I wonder what that tastes like. Or I remember that that vegan cheese was really delicious or whatever it may be. Those crackers. Oh, a new kind of cracker. Let me check this out. Bam, into the shopping cart. And then I get home and I've got more food than I planned to eat. And guess what I might eat first? If I'm a typical American, I'm probably going to eat the packaged thing that I just got that was an impulse purchase first. Meanwhile, the lettuce, the broccoli, the, the cabbage, the carrots, the onions are all going to sit in the fridge. And then end of the week, guess what? Some of that might be going bad and doesn't look so appealing. Who wants to eat wilted lettuce? <laughs> Off it goes into the compost pile. And this is a common dynamic, right? And we end up, the impulse purchases tend to be the least healthy calories, don't they? Yes. Uh, well, it depends on what you like. My husband, who is, finds a whole foods plant-based diet, the most delicious, uh, he will splurge on um, a dragon fruit. <laughs> so yes. it depends on what he's splurging well, on. I, but... I, I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> but, but for the most, for me, I would, I would want um, those crackers and that newest cheese you were talking about. So yes, I need to stay focused. Right. Absolutely. Well, here's the other piece is that the average American gets about 500 calories too much per day. And then we wonder why we have a 40% obesity rate and that 70% of us are overweight because of course we're eating too many calories. And so when you talk about meal planning, I'm thinking that one of the things that could also do is keep us a little more rigorous and accountable to the dietary patterns that we actually know are best for us. I, I, I think that if you're sticking to your meal plan 
and you're tr trying really hard in the grocery store to just stay focused. I know there are so many distractions and you mentioned that beautiful, colorful packaging. That is such a draw for people. I know I myself am distracted and it's easy to do this, do a double take and, and be drawn in by that design and those colors. So stay focused. You've got this, especially when you think about the alternative of all the things you can do with your money. Uh, you mentioned all of the vacations and the doing something nice for yourself, which I don't think we do often enough. So yeah, that's the absolutely. alternative. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, a lot of people think as if uh, going plant-based is somehow more expensive, but in reality, it's not, is it? I mean, when you go up the food chain, you're eating a, a more um, resource-intensive product. And even with all the government subsidies, meat still costs quite a bit more per pound than most plant foods do. I mean, beans are a lot cheaper than beef, right? N not just from an ecological standpoint, but from a cash standpoint. So. Can you tell us a little bit about how that works? And uh, is it really possible to save money as a vegetarian or vegan? Yes, I I shop in bulk. There are great grocery stores where I live in Sacramento that allow you even now to shop in bulk with the top down or the, up, the upright uh, bins. So I'm still shopping in bulk and that saves me a ton of money on my protein sources like beans and lentils and split peas and yellow split peas. And they're just, there's so many options. I think the big obstacle that people face is not knowing how to prepare them. And I have found that if you get the right tools in your kitchen, it will become immensely easier. And for me, that was investing in an Instant Pot. The Instant Pot has been my number one tool that has yes. revolutionized the way I cook and has inspired me to focus more on whole foods. So I do um, pinto beans on a regular basis. I toss those into the pressure cooker and I leave. I can go walk my dog. I can go about my house and clean and do work or whatever. And I have this pot of beans that I don't even have to monitor. I don't have to check the water. I don't have to do anything. And it only takes me I do 25 minutes of high pressure and then I take the top off and then let it do another 25 minutes to let the water absorb or, or evaporate. And it, the amount of effort is so minimal that it yes. just, it makes it so easy to eat healthy. And so learning how to, learning how to prepare these protein sources that are dry, because those are the cheapest, and then you can you can not put in the salt. You can um, flavor with flavor your beans with some garlic or some onion or some jalapeno or whatever, whatever you like. Uh, it it's just empowering to me. It really is. I mean, making friends with beans is really empowering because they're so economical. By the way, they're also good for the planet. Legumes in general actually sequester carbon and capture nitrogen out of the air into the soil, which makes the soil healthier than it was before. So uh, they're just a wonderful food. And uh, the, the more we can cultivate beans as a major food staple in the world, I think the healthier we will be and the healthier our planet will be. There was a study done looking at what people eat in the blue zones where people live the longest and healthiest lives. And researchers found that there was one food group that they all consumed in abundance and that was legumes. So they're high in fiber, they're high in plant-based protein. Um, they're really affordable, as, as you're saying. We like to soak our legumes for 24 hours or 48 hours, pouring the water off every 12 before we cook them because that sort of, uh, that makes them a little bit more bioavailable, a little more digestible. It also gets out any of the sort of problematic lectins that might be in there. So they're just a little bit easier to get all the nutri nutrition from your food. Um, but as you mentioned, pressure cooking is great. And I love the Instapot. I've got to say it's pretty awesome for convenience. And you don't have any, no, no more water boiling over on the stove. You know, I hate cleaning up messes on the stove. And I always feel so stupid. I'm like, oh, why didn't I turn it down at the right moment? But sometimes you're not there at the right moment. Well, with an Instapot, all those problems are gone. And it even saves energy, ultimately, because there's no waste. It's all totally enclosed. As you said, 25 minutes, it's so quick, right? Whereas on a stovetop, you could be cooking beans for hours to get that I, same result. My favorite thing about that particular tool is that I can 
take it on road trips with me. And that ensures that I'm eating healthy when I'm on the go. It has a saute function. So I can saute some onions and garlic or, or whatever, uh, first, and then add in my food, but it just, it makes traveling so, uh, so much easier and affordable and healthier. Yeah. So tell us about some of the other healthiest inexpensive foods. We've talked about legumes. What else? Are, what are your top ones? I have been looking at ways to use my my broccoli stalks. Uh, that's one of my new favorite things to consume right now, to shred them and put them in salads, to put them in soups. I used mm. to toss them before I knew, this is going back to, to reducing food waste, but right. I used to toss all of my uh, kale stems and my um, broccoli stalks, but using using the whole plant has been a changer for me. I, I love it so much. I have been growing a lot of my own food and I've been appreciating the whole plant. Uh, yeah. bef- at the grocery store, you can opt to buy the broccoli crowns, but you're missing out on so much goodness when you do that. So check out your, uh, check out the internet for the most amazing broccoli stock salads, soups, stews, you can throw them in stir fries and curries. Underrated, totally underrated. So using the whole plant, that's one of them. And then also I I really do live and die by beans and rice. It is so economical and healthy and can you can do so much with them. I think a lot of times we think that you can only do Mexican food when you do batch cooking of, we'll say beans, but you can toss them in pastas. You can make them, you can throw them on your salad. You can make, um, you can mash them up and make fillings. It's, it's a, it's a great ingredient to have on hand at all times. So beans. Great. Some of my other favorite grains are going to be corn. You can do really cool things, of course, with cornmeal or corn flour, you know, and there's tortillas and there's all kinds of polentas and things like that that you can make. But you can also uh, use corn on the cob or corn kernels. Of course, those are more sweet. And then I love quinoa and that's not the cheapest grain. But at the end of the day, even if it's, say, six dollars a pound, you're getting it, it doubles when you add water or more than doubles. And uh, you're still, you know, you could get like, if you had all of your calories, I sometimes I think, well, if I got 2000 calories from this food, you know, what would I spend for those 2000 calories? And of course you're talking about scenarios where people can spend, you know, uh, what a, a $25 a week. So you're talking about, you know, three or $4 a day total. Right. So that's, that's sort of like one end of the spectrum. And obviously you can go up a bit from there, but you know, with quinoa, you're looking at maybe $6 for your daily caloric needs, which is a little bit higher, but still quite affordable by most people's standards. Most of us are spending a lot more than that. So, you know, quinoa can be great. Um, actually all the grains really, I mean, millet, buckwheat, amaranth, teff, obviously, you know, for some people, wheat, oats are incredibly heart healthy and they're, they're pretty affordable too. Um, you want to go organic with that if you can because of glyphosate considerations. But, um, you know, oats are a wonderful food. Um, they bring down LDL cholesterol levels. They have wonderful soluble and insoluble fiber. So I'm big fans there. I love your mention about using the whole plant. And what's interesting is that sometimes when you do that, you get more nutritional value. For example, with broccoli, when we cook it, we're missing out on a lot of the sulforaphane that we could be getting from the raw cruciferous veggies and broccoli is especially potent here. And uh, cause that's, that's something that's only available when you combine the glucosinolates that are in there with certain enzymes that are in broccoli. But when you cook it, you kill those enzymes. So when you shred the broccoli stalk, for example, and put it on a salad, then you're getting this incredible nutrient power because you're getting that raw enzyme component, which mixes with the glucosinolates and gives you, gives your body the ability to produce sulforaphane, which is one of the most potent cancer fighters on the planet. It's an incredible compound. So, um, and that's what broccoli is like a superstar for. Broccoli sprouts even more so. But anyway, I, I just think that's really cool that you're turning a waste into a health superstar when you do that, right? Um, let's talk a little bit about, you, you mentioned growing food. And, um, 
you know, of course, depending on where people live and what time of year it is, there's different scenarios to consider there. Not everyone has backyard garden space, but sometimes you can grow food indoors, right? So what are your top foods that you think are a good bang for the buck growing? And, and I don't just mean uh, dollars spent, but also how easy they are to grow. I have grown food in containers. I have a vertical farm stand in my house for when it's cold outside. I have, uh, I now have quite a bit of, uh, I have 12 raised beds. So I grow the majority of my food in the summer. Uh, and, and from my experience, my favorite thing, although it, it is time consuming, is garlic. Growing garlic is one of my favorite things. I went to Whole Foods. I bought an organic uh, garlic head and I planted the garlic cloves. And then I had 15 whole garlic bulbs come up not too long later. So that wow. is my most rewarding. But greens are very easy to grow. Kale. I have been growing from the same plant for over a year now. I thought I would have to cut it back, but kale is really easy and you can control the types of practices that you have. So I do vegan gardening in my house. So I don't use blood meal or fish meal or manure or anything like that. And there are a lot of options for fertilizing your garden in compassionate ways. So uh, there are there are products that you can buy that are ready to go, or you can look at blends like um, cottonseed meal or soybean meal to enrich your, um, the, whatever you're trying to enrich in your garden, in your soil. And like you mentioned, once you start caring about your soil and learning about what naturally causes that rich, um, uh, you mentioned nitrogen and beans. That's exactly what I did for my nitrogen deficient uh, soil. I grew beans and I'm loving it. I've been snacking on them. Those are also really easy. And for, if you have a small space, I recommend herbs. I recommend getting a little pot and growing. I love oregano. That's my number one thing to grow because it's the easiest Cilantro is hard. Basil's a little bit challenging, especially if you live in the hot weather like I do. But oregano has been pretty easy for a beginner. Awesome. And I uh, got to put in a word for mint. Uh, it's oh. interesting. It's so easy to grow. It's perennial, which means you just have it year round. And um, it's, uh, of course, mint tea is fun, but I'm finding that adding a little bit of mint to a dish can make it kind of feel a lot more gourmet sometimes. Yes, I, I've been enjoying adding it to cucumbers or adding it to some wat, cut up watermelon. And if I have a guest, it really levels up this really easy appetizer just by adding yeah. a little bit of mint. Nice. Fabulous. What do you think about buying in bulk? Uh, what are the, the tips? What are the downfalls? What are the benefits? I appreciate right now that all of the available bulk bins around my area are the upright ones because then people can't put their hands in them. So uh, usually I'm a little bit uh, cautious of the ones where everybody puts their hands in, but now that, that that's not an option, I really like it. I recommend people uh, using reusable bags when possible. I, you can find them online in many different places and I'm trying to reduce my plastic and it's easy to rack up plastic when you're buying in bulk with the available plastic bag. So take your own bags if you can, or your own mason jars, if your store allows it. And, uh, and then beans, again, I keep going back to beans, but the cans of beans, a 15 ounce can of beans is, um, sometimes about a dollar twenty nine dollar fifty, sometimes two dollars for organic beans. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're buying in bulk, uh, they triple in size. The, the dry the dried beans will triple in size, and you can get them for about um, between a dollar and two dollars a pound of beans of dried beans that will triple in size. So it, right. it is unbeatable it, for a, for a protein source. Yeah. So you're saying a dollar to $2 for three pounds mm -hmm. of beans that are super highly nutritious. I mean, you just keep emphasizing that, but they're amazing, right? Um, yes. when it comes to economical, healthy eating, 
Okay, so, um, well, that's fabulous. Let's get to a few of the, oh, first let me ask you about frozen foods. Okay. What foods do you think are, are best for getting from the freezer section? I like getting some of my produce, um, sorry, my fruits. I like uh, wild blueberries, organic wild blueberries. I usually have almost everything on hand. I am fortunate to have space for two freezers. And I find that especially when I was living a life that was filled with travel, it made the most sense to always have frozen produce on hand. It was one of those things where if I had the best intentions and I went to the store and I bought everything fresh, it would likely go bad because I had to travel midweek for three days and it was going to go bad. So always having at least some things like maybe broccoli, some blueberries, stuff for smoothies available. And, um, and I like spinach, frozen spinach uh, was always helpful for me. Great. Thank you. Cool. That's, that's a good list right there. Um, so uh, let's see, we've got a bunch of questions from our whole Life Club members. Let's turn to some of them now. Um, Josephine asked, is it okay and a healthy option to get canned organic legumes or is cooking from the hard bean preferable from a health perspective? My supermarket often has canned legumes on sale. Uh, I prefer dried beans, but I, I'm not sure. I don't want to answer any nutritional, nutritional information. I don't feel qualified, but if you're talking okay. from a, sure. a financial perspective, of course, dried beans, but if, if you are hard up on time, canned beans are good too. Okay. Got it. Well, we've got a few nutritional questions, so I'll go ahead and address those when they come okay. up. Um, in terms of that one, I would say, um, that, uh, a lot of the studies done on the health benefits of eating legumes were with a mixture. And certainly a lot of people ate canned beans in that mix. So that's how a lot of beans are eaten in the United States and in many parts of the world. So yeah, they're probably uh, a fairly healthy food, but you do have a couple considerations. One is sometimes canned beans come with a lot of salt. Sometimes they come with other things, even lard in some cases. So make sure to read that ingredient label and see if it's really just beans or if there's other stuff added. And the other piece is that they often, um, you know, the cans can leach into the food a little bit. Um, and that's a concern. So, you know, this is, these are good reasons to go with making your own if you can, for sure. Um, and as was mentioned, it's definitely cheaper uh, than, than the canned beans, but canned beans are still a pretty affordable food, you know, yes. as foods go. Um, Nelly asked, how can I incorporate more omega-3s in a whole foods diet? So, um, obviously Tony, I know you don't want to get into nutrition too much, but, um, the major sources of omega-3s in a vegan diet are really going to be chia seeds, flax seeds, and algae sourced EPA and DHA. Um, so what's your thought on, uh, flax seeds and chia seeds? I try to put them in everything. I throw them in my breakfast. Uh, in my oatmeal and my smoothies and uh, especially the ground flax meal, which I ground my, myself. It's, yeah. I found that it's cheaper to buy the seeds and, and, and higher nutritional benefit, but uh, I, I purchase them in bulk. I store them in the refrigerator and then I grind them and then I throw them in pretty much everything. You can't taste them. They are only goodness. Yeah. So yeah, good, good, good thought there. We, we have a uh, coffee grinder that's dedicated for this purpose. And once a week or so, um, grind up, you know, a bunch of flax seeds and chia seeds. We combine them actually, uh, cause I figure it's good to have a little diversity and, uh, in the coffee grinder and then pop it into a Ziploc bag and keep that in the fridge. And then, uh, you know, add a couple tablespoons to my oatmeal in the morning couple tablespoons to a casserole or whatever. And what you're getting is this huge amount of protein, of course, omega-3 fatty acids, uh, lots of lignans, which are incredibly potent health promoters, lots of fiber. Uh, it's just it's just fantastic and remarkably affordable. I mean, people are spending quite a bit of money for all these fish oil supplements and so forth. And you can meet a lot of your omega-3 needs so much more affordably. And without the byproduct of cruelty, of uh, overfishing or of the potential exposure to mercury and microplastics. Um, 
you know, some people do, of course, choose to incorporate fish for their omega-3s, and they are the primary source of omega-3s in the modern diet. But you can get a lot of, especially ALA, which is sort of the, the foundational omega-3 from um, flax and chia seeds. I will add, though, that um, it's good to get some EPA and DHA2 um, for optimal health. So if you don't eat fish, it's recommended typically to get some algae sourced supplemental form. And of course, algae is where the fish get their EPA and DHA from. So you can, you can get those, you know, in, from a variety of stores and so forth. And that's probably recommended for, for most people. Um, Susan asked, how can I increase my HDL cholesterol? So I'm figuring, Tony, you'd probably like me to handle that one. Um, Please. I will say some of the top foods that have been linked to increases of HDL or so-called good cholesterol, which is kind of like the garbage trucks, by the way, it, it tends to go up when LDL goes up. And so if your LD HDL is low and your LDL is low, you probably don't need to be worried in most cases. But, um, but if your LDL is high, then you want more HDL to help clear out that LDL. So um, HDL is increased in studies by things like olive oil, which is a monounsaturated fat, as well as avocado oil, beans and legumes. Here we go again. Beans and legumes are amazing for increasing HDL levels. Whole grains, not, not refined grains like white flour, but whole grains are linked to higher HDL. High fiber fruit, um, as well as flax and chia seeds. There we go again with that and nuts in general. So those are the top, some of the top foods that are shown in studies to boost your HDL cholesterol levels. Uh, let's see, we heard from uh, Sierra who said, I'm the worst at meal prepping mainly because I don't want to spend my entire Sunday meal prepping for the week. What are some quick and easy meals to prep for the week and how do you make sure you add variety so you're not always eating the same types of foods? Is it possible to spend no more than two hours or so on a Sunday to do all the meal prepping for the week? Again, with the right tools, you can be in and out of the kitchen with minimal effort. I, uh, I've, I've already sung the praises of the Instant Pot, but having a good knife, I know it sounds so simple, but cutting your vegetables really quickly. And <laughs> uh, my husband is guilty of cutting his thumb multiple times. So we got him a glove. Oh. There's a glove that you can wear that you for for kitchen prep uh, that you keep your fingers safe. So if you're if you're afraid of your sharp knife, wear your your kitchen glove, and uh, you'll be in and out quickly with the right tools. Uh, some things that I like to do are when I'm meal prepping, I try to make the dish that I'm making very bland at first so that I can change the flavors throughout the week with different herbs, with different spices. So if I'm making, for example, a split pea soup, I will make it very basic the first day that I eat it. And then the next day I'll add some nutritional yeast uh, to my batch that I'm eating on that day. Then the next day I'll put some uh, different herbs in it. And then the last day I'll do something totally different. And it's already, uh, the moisture has been sucked out a little bit and now it's thick and I'll use it over some quinoa as a totally different dish with some hot sauce. And it feels different when it has different tastes and textures. So uh, thinking about how you can turn one meal into three different meals by reusing your food will make it seem more exciting throughout the week. Yeah, such a good idea. Thank you. And Marie asked, uh, does Tony have any favorite non-Amazon online sources for bulk ingredients? I have done a few online places like Thrive Market. I've used Thrive Market for bulk for bulk stuff. There's a new store called Veggie that has some bulk items as well. Um, but the, mo the one that I've used the most often has been Thrive for my bulk ingredients. Yeah, Thrive Market is sort of like a, um, it's a, it's a, what's the word when, when a buying group, like, like, they offer discounted prices. You pay an annual membership fee and then you get access to discounted prices and they, they essentially don't profit on their food sales. They make the money to fund the company on their memberships. So if you use it a lot, you can save quite a lot because the prices are lower than you'll find in stores. And, um, 
you know, and they all, they are all non-GMO and they have a lot of organic foods. They don't have produce, but for some of the bulk staples, it can be a great resource. Also, like any other grocery store, if you sign up for their e-newsletter, they have deals when certain things are a certain percentage off or, um, or if you are signing up for a membership during this window, you get a certain percentage off. So if you're on the fence, sign up for the email and see what comes up. Yeah, cool. Chelsea asked, how can I know which produce is in season so I can save money on produce purchases? And are the, what are the best places to buy affordable organic fruits and vegetables? I like to see what's available in my local community. So in our, in our town of Sacramento, our growing zone is 9B. And you can look up your growing zone in your area and see what is being grown at, at what time of the year. And then if you are in a town that has farmer's markets, you can look up um, the nearest farmer's market here in Sacramento. We have a farmer's market almost every day of the summer and you just find the location and it depends on where you're going, but almost all the farmer's markets here are very budget friendly or will be budget friendly toward the end of the market right before closing. Uh, when farmers don't want to take home whatever's left. So if you go at the end, you might be able to negotiate if you're on a tight budget. And if you are someone who receives uh, SNAP benefits, they do often take um, EBT cards at farmers markets as well. Yeah, thank you for that very much. Um, Tracy asked, it can often be difficult or feel difficult and wasteful to shop and cook for just one or two people. Everything at the supermarket feels family-sized. How does one manage to shop and cook for one or two without eating the same thing for five days in a row or freezing everything? That's a good question. I have found a few meals that work really well for that. Like I just made on my Instagram channel, uh, uh, I took a, a can, one can of beans, added some cilantro. I added some, um, a handful of tomatoes. You can add some red, red onion if you want to, and lemon juice. And it is delicious. A one person meal that took five minutes to make. There are whole cookbooks that are for one person or two people. There are whole blogs online that have the, the one person idea in mind. So do a little bit of research. There are a lot of resources out there. And um, sometimes the easiest things uh, that that sound like, like a can of beans with a few vegetables, they sound so simple. They are the best for one person. I also want to put in a, a word about the value of building more community around food. So if you're alone or live alone or with one other person, and, um, you know, you don't have to eat, your food world doesn't have to be isolated. If you can build connections with other people, you can start to pool. So for example, some people will cook dinners on Mondays and then their neighbor cooks dinner on Tuesday and they cook double and they share, you know? And whether or not you wanna to eat together is a whole other matter, but you can actually just drop off food for somebody um, and share that with them. And it's, it's an incredible act of love and connection. And if you have a common value system around food and health, then you get introduced to new types of cuisine. And it's actually sometimes more fun to cook for others than just for yourself, for some people. You, you get a little more elaborate. You, you put that sprig of mint in there, you know, you make it look a little nicer. Um, and then you get to reap the benefits of that as well. So, uh, you know, cooking in quantity and sharing, sharing the love can be a wonderful act of connection and it can build a bit of a feeling of food security. Like you're in it together. You've built connection with friends, family, coworkers, neighbors, people you love. And, um, so, you know, my mom will sometimes, she lives about a few miles away. She'll sometimes drop off food for us. She's like, oh, I made this great lasagna. It was too good to just eat. So I brought it for you and your kids and your family. And I'm like, oh, how sweet, you know, suddenly, all right, boom, there's dinner, <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, 
you know, so we actually have had to develop a system for returning her containers to her <laughs> so they don't all stock up at our house. Um, but it can be really fun and sweet to share food like that with people. And throughout history, breaking bread together, sharing a meal together has been an act of love and connection between people. So you're meeting the needs then for diversity, for building more food security, for building more connection, for, um, you know, getting, uh, you can actually save money and time because of course it's easier to cook in quantity. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it can also build more love in your life, which is also good for your health, by the way. So uh, I think that can be cool. I just wanted to share that, you know, we know about the benefits of carpooling. Some people do it when they're going to work regularly. Well, you can also do meal pooling, so to speak. And some people also at work, like rather than being at the mercy of the cafeteria or whatever they have at work, like Mondays, I bring lunch, Tuesdays, you bring lunch and we share like that, right? And so that kind of thing can really work out well when there's common values around it. Obviously no one wants to get to work and find out their coworker didn't bring food and they're hungry, <laughs> but if you can develop good systems, it can work out really well. I found that it's it's even nicer when you gift someone a cookbook mm -hmm. that is uh, the, the type mm -hmm. of food that you eat. Maybe they're unfamiliar, but if you gift them something and you say, hey, I thought, you might like this cookbook or um, these recipes that I printed out for you. It might incentivize them to accommodate your, your preferences for food. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for that. Um, Nicole said, um, she asked, what are your top tips for avoiding food waste? For example, if you need only a small amount of silken tofu for a recipe, how would you go about using the rest of the tofu from that 14 ounce package? So both money and food aren't wasted. I, if you're going to store, if you can't eat it immediately, you can store it by putting it in an airtight container with a little bit of water in the same way that it was packed. Uh, but if you can get to it right away, uh, maybe in the next morning, you can throw it in a smoothie. You can make, um, you can make a baked dessert with it. You can do so much. Tofu is another... I've already talked about beans, but don't get me started on tofu. If, if you're looking to get rid of it fast, throw it in a smoothie. You really won't be able to tell. It would only add the creaminess of, and smoothness to your smoothie. Here's and another protein. fun thing with tofu. It's remarkably simple with the extra firm tofu. Slice it up into thin slices, lay it out on a cookie tray, sprinkle Bragg liquid aminos over the top of it, and broil it in the oven until it gets kind of a little firm on top and then flip it over, get a little sprinkle of brag on there and then do the same. And you can wind up with something that's chewy and salty and it's great in sandwiches. It can be chopped up and put on top of, you know, a casserole or even sprinkled into a salad in chopped up pieces. It's kind of got that sort of meat like umami flavor that a lot of people like and are looking for in plant-based foods. And it also preserves it a little bit because it's in that salt and it's been dried out. And of course it's been freshly cooked. So it's like you're getting a brand new lease on life for that tofu. So, you know, it'll only keep a couple of days in the fridge like that, but that's, that can be a really fun, um, fun thing to do. Of course you can add seasonings and stuff too, but then those can potentially burn. This is just a super simple, simple way to do it. Um, Nicole also asked, do you find that making meals from scratch at home compared to purchasing pre-made plant-based meals is really cost effective? For example, can you share the cost difference between making homemade bean burgers and buying them from frozen section in the grocery store? I, I believe that when you're buying the ingredients, it, um, the amount, the quantity of food that you'll have that's homemade will be far greater than if you were to buy a package of, of pre-made burgers. Um, you can find burgers, some of them are at cheap, uh, the cheapest two to three dollars a patty, uh, while you can probably feed maybe, I'll say you can make 10 patties for similar, <clears throat> excuse me, similar, <laughs> sim you can make 10 patties at a similar cost. Yeah, that's right. And they might be healthier too. <laughs> yes, that yeah. is the truth. Because, because you know, a lot of, a lot of what's processed in stores is, is made, 
how do I put this for the average American consumer or for people who are transitioning? And if you're somebody who really values your health, then the odds are you're going to want to eat quite differently than the mainstream, quite differently than the norm. Um, now, we're all in a journey here. We don't want to make the perfect into the enemy of the good. Uh, I do think that some of the plant-based meats and things can have a place as a transitional food, but it's a journey. It's not a destination in the long run, learning how to be more industrious and develop a liking for foods that love you back um, is um, really empowering and it can save loads of money. And you can also get to really choose what ingredients you're consuming. So speaking of bean burgers, since we're just talking about that, tell us what you like to put in a bean burger, Tony. I, one of my favorite burgers lately is a, um, a chickpea burger with rice and herbs, and they hold together really well when you mash, uh, the, you could either mash them by hand, the, the chickpeas or throw them in the food processor and get them really ground up. And then you just throw your spices in there. I've been adding things like a little bit of cumin, a little bit of chili powder, uh, some oregano, cause I add oregano to everything. Uh, and then you just throw them in there. It's like six ingredients and they hold nicely. I put mine on the, on the grill on my stove and I make probably 12 at a time and freeze the rest and they hold up really well. So it's another great a meal prep, meal planning option. Fantastic. Um, what about organic foods? You know, do you, do you ever splurge on organic? Obviously it, it can cost more. What are your thoughts about that? I do. I, I purchase some things organic and I usually think about the price. So if it's within 50 cents or a dollar to buy the organic option, I will. And then I do try to buy my berries organic. Uh, and a few other things. Um, but the people I work with sometimes are really, really on a tight budget. And I would prefer them eat as much produce as possible than not eat the produce because it's too expensive and they're only focusing on organic. So I yeah. tend to say, eat the produce. Absolutely. And I always say, you know, if you're choosing between an organic donut and non-organic kale, go for the kale, you know, um, at <laughs> the same that. time, uh, one of the other tools that can be useful, if, if the biggest concern about organic, which it is for many people is pesticide residues, then uh, you can look at environmental working groups, Dirty Dozen and Clean 15, and focus on going organic with the most pesticide contaminated of the foods. And uh, as a general guiding principle, if there's some kind of a peel or a shell around the outside that you don't eat, that's going to tend to absorb and then uh, absorb a lot of the pesticides. And then when you discard it, you're getting a cleaner food. So talking about things like avocados or watermelons or mangoes or even papayas or bananas, um, these are all things that uh, it's not from a pesticide exposure standpoint, it's not as important to go organic with those types of foods it is, as it is with leafy greens or berries, which tend to be more absorbent and maybe berries most of all, because it's really hard to wash them well, because they just are so tender and they don't do well with a lot of activity on water to make them rot faster and so forth. So those are some principles that I think uh, can be helpful is to, to go organic when you can there. And again, the studies that we've seen that have shown, you know, thousands and thousands of studies showing health benefit to eating fruits and vegetables. Well, most of the fruits and vegetables in those studies were not growing organically and people still got incredible health benefits. So don't make the perfect into the enemy of the good and do what you can. And absolutely for those who can afford to go organic, we're helping seed a healthier economy. We're helping protect our bodies and our environment from pesticide exposure and farm workers too, by the way. And, uh, you know, and ultimately we're going to increase the demand for organic, which will eventually drive down the price of organic with the way our food system works. So good stuff to take when you can. And if you can't love yourself a whole lot and eat lots of fruits and vegetables. Um, Tony, are there any other key principles we haven't covered yet that you think we need to look at? No, I just wanted to add to what you were saying and, and say that uh, if you have the option to have a, a small garden in your backyard, you can grow some of those foods that are going to be a little bit more expensive to purchase organic and grow them organic yourself. That yes. could save you a lot of money in the long run. I, I know that fresh herbs can be a little bit pricier, but that's an easy thing to have on your balcony or in your windowsill. So uh, 
if, if you're concerned about wanting organic, try growing it yourself if you have the space. So good. And by the way, let's put in a good word for sprouts. You can sprout mung beans and um, chickpeas and soybeans and all sorts of things. And uh, and you can cook, either you just make a little baby sprout and then you start cooking it and you get actually a different nutritional profile, or you can make a bigger sprout. Broccoli sprouts are incredible nutritional powerhouses. And interestingly, you actually get more vitamins and minerals than just from the seed itself because of the bioavility and because of the way that photosynthesis works and the sprouting process just makes the plant sort of come alive and a seed goes, yes, I love life. And then when you eat that, you're getting all of that life force and vitality and nutrition. Uh, so it's very economical. You can just have a glass jar, like a mason jar with a sprouting lid that's sort of got little holes punctured in it. And, uh, you know, soak a quarter cup or a couple tablespoons of your favorite sproutable seed overnight, and then pour off the water twice a day and rinse it and leave it sort of sitting in the dish drainer or whatever. And in a few days, voila, you're gonna have sprouts in there and you can eat them raw in salads or you know, if it's a legume, you may decide to steam it. Either way, amazing nutrition comes out of that. All right, well, Tony, it's been, it's been great talking with you about all this. And I just wanna thank you so much for helping bring healthy food, plant-based food, uh, and make them affordable and accessible to more and more people. One of Food Revolution Network's core goals is to bridge the divide so that healthy food doesn't have to be some kind of elitist luxury. It can be accessible and affordable to everybody. And wherever we are economically, here's the reality. If we can uh, be more efficient about our resource consumption, whether it's monetary or otherwise, we free up resources. And those resources can always be dedicated towards things that matter whether it's time off work or vacations, or whether it's helping people who don't have enough to feed their own families, which there's way too many of those in the world right now. So um, wherever you are on the economic spectrum, I just wanna thank you for your interest in how to be more frugal and efficient. And I wanna invite you to use whatever resources you free up on behalf of your core values, whatever that means for your life, for your health, for your family, and for your social impact. And Tony, I just thank you so much for liberating people. Really, it's funny how boundaries and frugality can actually be a source of liberation, isn't it? It can, it can open up our life to have more freedom. Absolutely. Financial freedom is really amazing. I, as I mentioned, I had been on a budget for quite some time, and it's one of the removing that weight has been an amazing thing. And also, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for everyone for for watching and uh, I really admire everything that you're doing and I, I just appreciate you for having me on the show. Thank you so much. This is Ocean Robbins and Tony Okamoto, thanking you so much for joining us today and wishing you health and vitality and lots of good food and lots of frugality and lots of freedom. Have a beautiful day. When it comes to cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, heart disease and other chronic illness, what really matters isn't how many books you read, how many webinars you attend, or how much you know. What really matters at the end of the day is what you eat and how you live. The science has given us what we need to know. Now it's time for action. It's time to implement and optimize your healthy lifestyle. It's time to get results. It's time to say goodbye to confusion and hello to clarity. It's time to say goodbye to bad habits and hello to good ones. It's time to fall in love with foods that love you back. It's time to join a community that will support you in achieving your goals. It's time for Whole Life Club. Click the link to find out more and to join in now.